here we are with Santiago Ruel, his partner at Terrify Capital, one of the most active investment funds in DeFi. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for joining me in the Defined podcast. Oh, pleasure is mine, uh, Cami. Thanks for thanks for hosting me. Great. So, of course, we'll get into Terrify's investments, uh, your thesis, uh, your view on DeFi. Uh, but first, as always, I always like to get to know my interviewees a little bit better. So why don't we start with, you know, telling me about your background and how you got into crypto? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my background is in traditional finance. I was at uh, JP Morgan. Um, and that's where I first discovered Bitcoin in 2012. Mm. And really for me, what really drew me in was the remittance use case. I'm from Mexico. And so really being able to move money cross border continues to be a big pain point. People mm -hmm. are being charged five, 10, even more cents on the dollar to send money cross border. And that to me was a killer use case of Bitcoin. So I really got my hands dirty on it, started buying Bitcoin and sending it to Mexico to my family. And mm -hmm. for me, that's where it really clicked. That was an aha moment. And my new remittances are a huge flow of capital. And so, you know, it really comes from a perspective of <clears throat> asking, there ought to be a better way to do things, right? And that's a guiding principle for investing is if you were to redesign a financial system from scratch, how would it look like? And I think we certainly can agree that the financial system as it stands today has a lot of gaps and hasn't really caught up to the internet. So that was always in the back of my mind, kind of nagging at me. And mm -hmm. when Ethereum launched, as you do a great job in your book, I mean, I think it was fascinating to see the programmability of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has been really the financial applications. I was investing in open source software and FinTech at the time at a, at a fund um, called SageView Capital. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really started to get more and more, more involved in projects like Ethereum and uh, other applications being built on top. Um, and really joined Parify uh, with my partner, Ben, uh, to really double down on this thesis that blockchains are going to totally transform how we think about finance, how we think about money, how we think about value. And it is very exciting to see, I think, the early signs of that. So I'll pause there. Hopefully that. Yeah, no, that's there. perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, so, super interesting to hear how you were drawn into Bitcoin because of the remittance use case and how you were using it firsthand in, in Mexico with, with your own family. Um, and at, at the time you were at JP Morgan, were you able to kind of influence uh, any of, of your own work there and, and kind of bring Bitcoin in or, or was it just like something you were doing on the side? Yeah, no, it was, I mean, I had to go to the local Bitcoin center in New York to buy my first Bitcoin. I mean, there, there was, very rudimentary infrastructure at the time. There's small meetups. I would show up with suit and tie and people look at me in a very weird way. Mm -hmm. um, JP Morgan has been very active in crypto, as you mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. and, and now recently with consensus, but at the time it was, it was not even in the map, right? Okay. Uh, over time, um, you know, I think as a lot of investors in this space that now are full time, you struggle to really sell the vision of blockchain of crypto at your fund or at your company. And that just really puts in perspective, we are so early here mm. because I think very, there are a lot of different narratives and stigmas associated with crypto. Um, and I think that at some point you realize I have to do this full time, right? Mm. This space has so much innovation, so much talent that it's hard to keep up even on a full time basis. And so, yeah. yeah, it's been sort of an uphill battle. I think I talked to a lot of fund managers too, and they, they all come to that realization that you can't do it from a traditional organization okay. uh, you have to kind of part ways and i came to that conclusion and, and joined parify um so when when was this that that you left uh, and, and went to go like full-time crypto yeah so i've been investing in a personal capacity kind of crypto mm -hmm. by night um mm -hmm. over the last seven years and then i fully decided to start it running my own staking uh kind of like operating nodes to validate that was like over a year ago. And then, um, you know, my background's in investing. That's what I love to do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, really over the last year and a half was contemplating raising a fund, joining a fund. And that's where I landed with Parify. Okay. Uh, and it's sort of how I think about the world, how I think about investing in crypto is very much aligned with how Parify as an organization look at the world. Okay, so let's talk about that. Like, what what is yeah. like Parify about? Like, what's the investment thesis? How do you go about finding opportunities? 
Yeah, excellent. So, I mean, the, the core bet that we're making is that um, the one of the most killer use cases of blockchain technology is to um, transform financial infrastructure. So we are investing in, think of it as the next wave of innovation of fintech um, combined with open source and really powered by blockchain technology, right? And that includes, you know, all the different lending verbs that you can, th or money verbs that you can think of, lending, borrowing, you know, derivatives, insurance. Uh, and, and so for us, that is the bet that we're making broadly is that, that this is a secular trend. Finance is going to be transformed probably from the outside in. And then we start saying, okay, what are the immediate kind of, how do we think about um, the different pieces of infrastructure that need to be built to provide what we call DeFi, which is decentralized finance. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is copying, I think, parts of silos of the traditional finance world into DeFi, porting those over but then also mashing up different combinations to create new primitives like flash loans. And so for us, I think we have an ear to a good pulse on what has worked in traditional finance and copying that over. Um, plus also new primitives that are uniquely enabled by in this ecosystem. And so um, as, as it relates to how do we form thesis, how do we go about finding opportunities? It really comes from sort of a, um, first identifying what are the what are the applications that need to be built what are the use cases that are missing in this ecosystem so one of for instance we say hey look we need it we ought to be able to borrow at a fixed rate mm -hmm. and that is not typically possible today but we look at traditional markets where the notional amount of fixed rate borrowing versus variable is 25 times larger mm -hmm. so someone's going to solve that someone's going to crack that nut and so we'll go out and find and then once we build that thesis we say well, let's go out and find the best operators that are going to execute and place bets or a bet accordingly. Um, mm. Another opportunity, you know, hey, how do we do under collateralized loans? Everything right now in the system is very collateral over collateralized for a reason, right? Mm. There's no reputation layer in crypto. Uh, how do we think about insurance? Uh, how do we think about, uh, so that's kind of from, from first principles, we go back and say, this is how the system should look like. And then from there, drill down and say, okay, let's find the best operator that can execute on the business. Okay, so do you look do you look at traditional finance and and say these are the main pieces that make things work, and so what needs to be built in kind of this parallel financial system, um, for it to work, and, and so that's how you come uh, with with this thesis like, um, okay, we need under collateralized loans, we need uh, fixed rate loans, we need insurance, um, and and then go after kind of the people building those things. Is that kind of correct? Okay. Yeah. And I think different from a lot of funds, what really informs our thesis as well is that we're power users of these networks. Mm -hmm. So we're actually interacting with a lot of these protocols. And so that informs, you know, it's, it's coming from a pain point, you know, it's like, God, um, I wish that the collateralization ratio wouldn't be 150%. Mm -hmm. Maybe it could be lower. Uh, I wish I could borrow at a fixed rate. I wish I could buy more cover on Nexus or, or more insurance for my portfolio and how I think mm -hmm. about risk management. So a lot of that is, we're actively interacting with these networks. And I think that is a big source of, from that vantage point, we'll say we identify the pain points that need to be, or the areas of opportunity that need to be built in this system. Okay, interesting. Um, what about those things that are kind of outside the box and, and like aren't even in traditional finance? Like how do you arrive at, at those uh, pieces? No, certainly. Uh, it's super exciting. I mean, that was sort of our investment in Bave was predicated on that to some respects. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at flash loans and uh, uh, just for the audience, flash loans allow you to borrow and repay in a certain block in the same block. Mm -hmm. And that is a trader's best dream. So imagine, imagine that you're really good at finding uh, real estate. So you walk around, you see a house and you say that's worth two and a half million dollars and you can buy it for a million and you have another buyer that's willing to buy it at two and a half. And so you, you see this delta because you're good at real estate. You have an mm -hmm. eye. Well, what's the problem? If you don't have the capital to buy the house and then resell it, none of this works Right. in traditional finance. Mm -hmm. With flash loans, you can't. Mm -hmm. You don't need the capital. You don't need to front the capital. So all of a sudden, it creates so much efficiency in the system because it allows smart developers or anyone in the world really to take advantage of these arbitrage opportunities. And in this case would be to borrow uh, a million to buy the house and then sell for two and a half and pocket one and a half. Right. Um, 
And you might argue, well, what's the value of all that? Well, it's like, well, it creates more resiliency in the system. It cre it, it it creates more efficiency in the sort of this bit this spread, right? And it incentivizes more market participants. Um, and it lowers the barriers to entry that you don't need to have capital uh, to um, interact in the system. And that's when you think about traditional finance, you need to have a prime brokerage account and only mm -hmm. the big boys can play or invited to the big poker tables. No, actually right now it's the smartest guys in the room might be a retail investor, might be a, I would say retail is not the right word, might be a very smart individual that has a really good pulse for finance. And I think it's totally transforming the way that we think about giving access to more players in the system, right? And democratizing this sort of access to, to capital. Right, no, for sure. I, I think that's what's so exciting about decentralized finance, which is really, you know, I think better described as open finance, you know, just th this system that, that's open yeah. to anyone who, who can and, and wants to use it. And, and definitely tools like flash loans make it even easier um, because it, it doesn't, you don't need to have that much capital to, to start uh, playing anymore. Um, I mean, granted, it is super risky. And I mean, I mean well, not ri not that risky because you, you can't just like return the loan within the mm -hmm. first block if the trade doesn't uh, doesn't work right. out. Um, That's right. But but you need you need I mean, for it to be profitable, you need to like find find like all the pieces to match in like a very short period of time. So I guess like it's like it reduces the barriers of entry in, in terms of capital, but you still need to be like a, like very technically savvy and um, an experienced trader to use many of these of these protocols. Still, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. We're I mean I think that really conce con conceptualizes how early we are in the system. It's it's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of hobbyists, if you will, mm -hmm. that are interacting with these protocols and testing them out. And, but that's a good thing, you know. I think mm. that's a natural evolution of, of technology, you know. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, the, um, the, the other primitive that we see is, uh, sorry, I was just saying, like collectibles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Broadly, a lot of people tell us, well, how do you think about DeFi? Like, it, it's very niche -y, it's very small. Like, why just specialize in DeFi? Why not, like, touch everything in blockchain, like, all the different use cases that we were promised but still haven't shipped? Mm -hmm. uh, in our response to that, it's like, well, it has a system that has the most product market fit, actually earnings, traction, users, uh, and the value proposition is is too hard to ignore. It sort of fulfills this characteristic of 10x better than the traditional finance. And I think mm -hmm. you alluded to it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but broadly speaking, like how we define DeFi is transfer of value, full stop. And when you think about what value means when you have digital scarcity, which you've never had before, mm -hmm. then you start seeing the possibilities of this system where, I mean, the way we think about money has been really around for 80 years since Bretton Woods. like. I mean, if you look over time, there's been rye blocks and whale bone and mm -hmm. whale fat that have fulfilled the moneyness property, baseball cards, right? And I think we're seeing a really interesting like confluence of trends from like, you know, metaverse, like Fortnite and video games and esports combined with like everyone's online. And the way we think about value, I think will radically change. Like, is it crazy mm -hmm. to think that you can use your crypto kitties as collateral for a house in five years because you have AMMs like you have systems that provide good price discovery on digital scarcity and I mm -hmm. think that fulfills a really that's a new primitive that is going to I think unlock so many different applications so many different use cases with composability it's so interesting so how how do you think our idea of, of money is changing because of of these technologies like is it is it something like anything can be money you know like you, you can tokenize anything and put it on an exchange or putting on a lending platform and and use it to yeah like take out a loan or 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 uh, open a savings account and and do things that you would before only do with with like currency yeah it is fascinating i think uh i think that you have to think about what defines good care properties of money like moneyness right it's 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 a recognizable, like there's a market participant that recognize value in this. Mm. Uh, there is like, a, 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 it's tangible, it's, 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 uh, it's divisible. And it's also, you know, it, there, there are certain properties of like um, authenticity, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think blockchain checks a lot of those boxes, right? You have digital scarcity, you have provability by code that mm -hmm. there's only X amount of Bitcoin or X amount of crypt collectibles or X amount of whatever token. Um, 
you also have a, a very fluid market where you know, like uh, anyone can be provide a market on any token really and mm -hmm. i think candidly you've never had global untethered pools of liquidity that are interacting in a very explosive way and i think we're seeing that right historically mm -hmm. like if you had a baseball card well the baseball card could break right? Mm -hmm. right how do you prove the authenticity of the baseball card well you know kind of you have mm -hmm. experts that kind of look at the card and and then and then well it's very localized like how do you mm -hmm. sell maybe ebay or maybe paypal allowed you to like put your collectible on there and like sell your baseball cards massive markets wine art but now you have digital representations of these things with provable certainty that they're authentic mm -hmm. with price discovery right. at a global scale mm -hmm. and so that i think checks a lot of the boxes of money it's so interesting. Um, so I wanted to get back to a kind of a, a how you, you're investing at Firefly. So um, are you, because you said you're, you're very active in these protocols yourselves. So um, besides tokens, are you investing in, in the platform's um, equity as well? Or are you only doing tokens? Yeah, both really. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the, we're sort of, uh, we have a view of where things um, that I, we, we, we come for, at it from, we think tokens are probably the best coordination um, mechanism, full stop, mm -hmm. uh, to reward participants in the system, um, to bootstrap capital efficient networks, right? If you think of Uber, as opposed to just giving equity to a few investors, now you have the possibility to give in these networks like Compound, Balancer, Uniswap or not Uniswap now, but you, you're giving tokens to everyone in the mix, right? You're giving mm -hmm. tokens to employees, founders, investors, drivers, passengers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so the, the coordination of all, Uber required a lot of capital to bootstrap and right and, and expand geographically and, and acquire drivers and incentivize them. But a token totally shifts that on its head and says, hey, I'm gonna incentivize everyone in the system to use the system and, and have skin in the game. And I think mm -hmm. that's why we think tokens are, are super powerful coordination mechanism to bootstrap these networks that otherwise would be super capital uh, intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why you see it sort of a zero one moment of a lot of these networks. A lot of people are like, how is it that Compa went from X valued lock to, you know, just issued a token and then it did that in, in, yeah, in deposits and borrow? Well, when you align incentives, it's very, very powerful. Magic happens. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> exactly, right? Uh -huh. uh, it's sort of a, a Taleb talks about the skin in the game. But mm -hmm. but we approach it as, look, our, our philosophy is to find the best operators. Mm -hmm. We find the best companies. We try to get them at the earliest stages. And a lot of times that's an equity. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of the market's realizing that issuing a token for a lot of these companies makes a lot of sense. Not mm -hmm. all of them, but for most of them to really, it's effectively like... Uh, a way to scale very efficiently. Right. Um, are there cases where the equity and the token are misaligned? Like what's good for a token investment isn't good for the equity in investor? And like when when are cases when that happens? Yeah, it, it's, a good, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think you either have one or the other. Um, and at a different evolution of the company's life cycle, you might have equity and then you migrate to tokens and everyone is incentivized to accrue value at the token layer. If you have dual structures or dual tokens like Neo had two tokens, or it just introduces a lot of complexity and misalignment of incentives. Mm -hmm. So I think like we've seen, you know, I guess an example would be like Binance for instance has equity in Binance and then it has the BNB token, which is a burn on the fees. Mm -hmm. It's not, we don't consider that DeFi because it's, it's not, uh, I guess it's, it's centralized and, but that, in, that, it, that could create a whole host of different incentives, right? Because if you have the burn tied to gross profit, then Binance might want to have more operating expenses to not burn as much tokens. And then it creates a weird set of incentives. We like to look at it, uh, the more cleaner the structure, the more simple the monetary policy, the better. Okay. Uh, and everyone under an equity, you know, in Compound, for instance, everyone sort of migrated to tokens, uh, the team, the cap table, the investors, and liquidity providers and borrowers in the system are earning comp. And uh, it creates governance and everyone's, everyone's a stakeholder in that system. And I think that mm -hmm. produces, the incentives are very 
clear and aligned, I think, in that in that system. But when you say that you've migrated to to tokens, I mean you, you're still holding equity, right? Yes. Yeah. But I mean, in, in what way do do you feel like that that's a, a migration? Um, well, I think most of the value will just accrue to the tokens. Um, okay. There may no. be yeah. We sort of think like equity at that point is kind of loses value it's sort oh, of got it. deprecated okay um there may be an instance like where compound might act as a development shop or the comp system and there might be some residual equity value but the real the, the value in the system is in the token that accrues fees and um, that's so interesting right because now um what's most valuable is the open protocol and the the token is what's linked to that protocol um, whether while the the company itself is is kind of um, losing its control right o over over the yep. protocol and, and becoming kind of a, a more separate structure to it so yeah that, that's interesting to, to see how even at the kind of investor um, layer these these two pieces are are kind of separating um, so it's not just kind of um, philosophically you know uh, we're, we're becoming more decentralized you know it, it's actually you know happening um f for those who invested in in the company it, it's uh yeah it's crazy I, I almost think of them as cooperatives everyone has skin mm -hmm. in the game to make this system work and you wrap it around with a token mm -hmm. uh, that in this case has governance rights you're voting for proposals to change mm -hmm. some parameters in the system but everyone is voting and everyone is very incentivized. The team, the investors, the community, the liquidity providers, the borrowers, they all are, um, I guess, a lot. They all have the same instrument that accrues value. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's very powerful. How active are you, are, are, is Parify in governance of these protocols? Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, I think we, we have a view on certain, uh, you know, we've been quite active in Maker, we've been active in, in Compound, uh, and, and we've been helping other protocols kind of design their governance and their token mechanics. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think yeah, that is a core part of, I think that that is a core part of investing in crypto, we think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, it's like, it's no different than I think being active at the board level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have a much wider board and shareholder meeting, right? Mm -hmm. But there, there still are kind of stewards and anchors uh, at the governance layer that, um, you know, guide the community, guide, pr we pr we've put forth certain proposals in these systems that we think are beneficial. Right. Um, yeah. uh, so I wanted to ask you about how this kind of level of participation of um, VCs and funds and uh, and the stake that they they have in in the token is is becoming kind of um, seen in an increasingly bad light in kind of the broader kind of DeFi community at, at least like if you go by uh, uh, crypto Twitter you know um, and and, right. and not just crypto Twitter but just like the the projects that have been launched recently have very explicitly said. Um, we're not taking VC investments, um, and this, you know, this project is going to be open to everyone. So what's, what's your take there? I mean, what's kind of the, the role of um, VCs and, and, and funds in this world where the tendency is to become the most decentralized possible at the start? Yeah, I think... Um... You know, we, we think that we bring a lot of value to the table in helping a company. I mean, we're ex we take sort of this private equity mindset. My partner Ben was at KKR. I was at a at a fund that, that is started by KKR like partners, and it's really once you make an investment, we apply a lot of resources to help the team on the go to market token design um, and be active in governance. And I mm -hmm. think you look at historically political systems I, I think offer a good analogy to how things work um, you have representative democracies whether it's how it exists in the US or well, I think of it more of a parliamentary system where you have elected representatives that I think act on behalf of the network in the UK for instance at any moment's notice if the if the crowd is unhappy with Parliament they can dissolve Parliament through a referendum mm -hmm. and 
when you combine that with the transparency of how we're voting, how we're interacting, I think it creates this sort of Heisenberg principle because Terrify, we know that everyone can look at how we're voting mm. in Compound. Everyone can look. There is a level of accountability, ownership, skin in the game, invested interest in these systems that I, I think align incentives to the shelling point around let's make this grow and let's let's make this the most robust, stable system. And I think the fact that we are held accountable, even though we may have a lot of economic weight to vote, is is very powerful because we know that at the end of the day, this level of transparency is just you've never had before, right? If someone is delegating their vote to me as a as a as a large comp holder, they can undelegate at any given moment in time, right? And and I think that you know, everything that we vote is on chain, is visible. And so it creates a level of ownership and accountability that aligns incentives very well. Um, mind you, I think there's also this concept of, there's a very typically vocal minorities. There's the minority that's extremely vocal, but not necessarily representative of the broader view. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a little bit of that dynamic when you look at crypto Twitter and you look at forums. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not making broad statements. I think case by case, uh, fund by fund, there are instances where a fund may not add value or may want, have different incentives. We like to take a more holistic view. And look, at the end of the day, there's nothing like game theory when you play an iterated game and you take the long view. One, it's so early. And two, I think we all have an alignment of incentives to grow these systems in a way that are anti-fragile in a way that really becomes scalable, usable by as many as many people as possible. We take the view that we are creating a lot of value here for like win-win, you know? It's not that a VC wins and a traditional other investor might not win. I think that's not how we think. Uh, mm-hmm. And we like to help teams as much as possible. And so sometimes it's not getting in the way, right? Other times it's redesigning a token and uh, or helping them connect with market makers or CFI, you know, that's looking to get more into DeFi, things like that, right? Yeah. No, There's a sense. lot that happens under the hood that mm-hmm. I think is not visible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fine, you know? Right. Like, like the connections that you provide or the help or yeah, yeah. advice, of course. Yeah. I would encourage, you know, like go talk to our founders. I mean, we live and die by our reputation. Mm-hmm. Know that anyone that's criticizing funds, at least our view is, we live and die by that. And that's yeah. the most important thing that we have from a deal sourcing perspective. Mm-hmm. And so, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, talking with uh, like DeFi specific funds, like yourselves, uh, Framework, 1KX um, and others, like it, it's, it's really remarkable to me how kind of active you need to be in DeFi or, um, or at least how active uh, m- many of these DeFi specific funds um, are, it, it just, it isn't, it, it doesn't seem like, you know, it's, it's something that you can kind of buy and hold these tokens and forget about it and come back in 10 years and see, you know, what they did and try to make an exit. It's you buy and then you're actively trading and providing liquidity and um, I don't know, lending, borrowing, or whatever needs to be done. Um, it's 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 such a huge change. I mean, how how do you experience it from coming from the other side? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, this is sort of the fundamental premise of why I think at a at a personal level decided to join uh, and like start a, a crypto native fund. Uh, mm-hmm. I think investing in, in crypto, specifically DeFi, is a totally different game. And was not convinced that traditional funds, you know, the Sequoias of the world, the KKRs of the world, are well equipped to win in this space, mm-hmm. because it requires active management at a whole new level. I mean, we mm-hmm. we approach it from we have a whole vehicle that provides liquidity to these networks, which is the lifeblood of a lot of in DeFi. You know, it's mm-hmm. sort of like, and so we are able to provide more uh, fluidity in these systems with capital, with liquidity, um, as an example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're right. I mean, I think it, it requires active management. I think we're, 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 we're extremely busy. Uh, you know, I think mm-hmm. investing is just one part of, I think the tip of the iceberg and all, everything mm-hmm. else that we do. Uh, and that's honestly the, the more fun part of this game. Um, 
it is it uh and i think being in a team where collectively we kind of have multidisciplinary approach you have to think of a system like maker you have to understand economics monetary policy uh incentives uh you know uh, governance and political systems mm -hmm. uh, cryptography uh engineering and so it requires um um like a whole host of, of skill sets uh that individually none of us may have but collectively we think that we bring to bear kind of like that that package uh, of the mm -hmm. verified package but yeah it's 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 um it's 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 fascinating yeah for sure so this is kind of like a more tactical question but interested to to understand how something like this is structured so do you have like okay so one fund that's for your DeFi uh, like equity investments, another one for the tokens, and then like a separate one that's like trading and yield farming and like deals with that sort of piece of of like yeah. the investing. We have two funds. Yes, one is uh, the main fund, which invests in both tokens and equity, mm -hmm. um, and and the second one is a credit fund, which provides uh, liquidity and its effect. It started as a, as a stablecoin arbitrage arbitrage fund oh, it. and it's since gravitated more towards yield opportunities uh, but market neutral effectively um how do you remain market neutral well we're 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 most of what we deal with is stable coin so you know you're not taking a directional view on the price of ethereum or some other digital asset you're just you know taking a view on on stable coin arbitrage opportunities because when you think about their each system like die might is subject to monetary policy of maker so changes to that monetary policy might cause a die to deviate from its peg mm -hmm. the stable coins are meant to maintain a, a peg but mm -hmm. they deviate from that peg and so any movement around that due to monetary policy or imbalances in supply and demand we're able to capture uh, mm -hmm. algorithmically and and um and you compound that and it creates a very interesting yield uh, and we've been doing this for quite some time before sort of the agricultural revolution of sorts. Uh, <laughs> but, but certainly when Maker launched, I'm uh, sorry, when, when Compound issued token and kind of like opened up this uh, whole explosion and panacea mm -hmm. of, of, of liquidity mining, you know, we looked at what synthetics did way back. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's sort of like the, the OG of, 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 of liquidity mining. Um, yeah. But yeah. What interesting opportunities are you seeing now or in that fund? Uh, in the credit fund? Or yeah. in the main fund? In the credit fund. Um, I think there's a fascinating rotation of capital that's happening very rapidly and across networks um, to capture on uh, optimized yields. Um, we're seeing uh, synthetic Bitcoin come into DeFi, which is, mm -hmm. I think, you're barely scratching the surface. I mean, something like REN is, has seen an explosion of volume as of late. Uh, mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks, um, especially since they open source their code. And, you know, I think we're seeing this, um, it's like, we're seeing like a gold ETF of sorts, like you have Bitcoin, which is gold, but now you can utilize it, you can energize it by mm -hmm. interacting with Ethereum. And, and I think a lot of Bitcoin uh, folks have been hesitant uh, to kind of interact with DeFi, but I think uh, the opportunity set is kind of too, the opportunity cost is, is coming to a point where it's too hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. And you can layer it with insurance and you can have more Lindy effect with a system like Ren to get more confidence that, you know, the system actually works and it's battle tested and it's secure. Um, and so I think that's a big opportunity. I mean, we're seeing Ren is now, you know, I think at 0.1% of all Bitcoin is now uh, secured in Ren in a matter of like weeks uh, or call it a month. Yeah. Now, when you really zoom out and say, well, what percentage of Bitcoin do you think is going to interact with Ethereum and DeFi? Mm. What percentage of dots, atoms, uh, all these different systems? I think we're starting to see that connectivity, cross blockchain connectivity that I think is where it's early and I'm, I'm quite excited to see where that goes and grows. So how do you take advantage of that? Of like, if you think, yeah, you'll get more non-Ethereum assets on Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I think something like RenVM is quite interesting or Keep. Uh, you know, what are the projects that are creating these bridges? Um, so like communication, buying the token? Yeah, from the main fund, we would say, hey, well, let's put a position and have exposure to this secular trend that we see of mm. connectivity across blockchains. And whoever's mm -hmm. going to do it is going to create 
probably meaningful value, right? And we look at that would be an example of uh, mm -hmm. how we express a position in that. Um, interesting. Yeah. Um, what other interesting opportunities are you seeing for your other fund? Uh, the main fund. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think like a you know synthetic representations of real world assets is something that I'm quite excited about. Mm -hmm. You have a couple of projects like Centrifuge or or even Synthetics that could do this. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's quite. I, with with more robust Oracle designs, I think we'll start to see more and more uh, digital assets being ported over and have a digital representation of that. Mm. Um, I think that's, you know, Aave's starting to get into this territory where you have like tokenized mortgages, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, they also announced under collateralized loans, like this credit delegation. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, right? You have a very arguably very inefficient system because it's over collateralized. But uh, the moment you have a reputation layer, something like Teller or a couple other projects that are trying to build a better reputation system to create like trusted pools of liquidity that mm -hmm. are whitelisted that, you know, say that I know you Kami and I think you're a good, you know, you have some certain credit worthiness, like micro loans, right? Like Muhammad Yunus kind of Grammy bank. And I mm -hmm. say, yeah, you know, I'll, I have land, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, you can borrow from me at a lower rate and under collateralized because I trust you. And so mm -hmm. I think, uh, his initially the system had to be over collateralized because right. no one trusts anyone. Like that's sort of the fundamental premise of blockchain. Like you don't, it works because you don't need to trust anyone, mm -hmm. but there is an opportunity to create trusted pools of liquidity, um, that reduce collateralization ratio and build a reputation layer. I think mm -hmm. that makes sense. And I think yeah. that's a big opportunity that we'll see this year and in the next year. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think options generally are a fascinating space. You talk about like, how do you, you know, I will say there's still a lot of risk in these systems. Um, mm -hmm. And so being able to insure against smart contract risk, uh, being able to buy options, uh, and then uh, I think is, is still very nascent. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Nexus has done a good job to some respects, but I mean, every time they issue cover, it, it just gets gobbled up by the market. Yeah. Um, there are trade-offs in their design, you know, it's KYC and a number of things. Um, and the way the, 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 the premium is priced is kind of like a black box, mm. but uh, options are a more elegant market-driven kind of um, mechanism for risk, right? Okay. Anytime so you let the market, like... oh, sorry. something like open or Hedgic or, mm -hmm. or a couple of projects that we're looking at, like Potion, for instance, are trying to crack this nut, like prim uh, primitive, there's a number of projects in the space that I think all have different kind of interesting design features of how to like back into volatility. Yeah. It's so interesting to see all these uh, pieces being built from the ground up, you know, something as like prevalent as options in traditional markets, you know, like trillion dollar market uh, that's been around for ages. And we're just seeing kind of the very first uh, projects rising in, in DeFi. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. My God, I mean, like you look at like the, it is, I think we're so early in this space mm -hmm. um, and there's so much infrastructure that needs to be built. Um, I mean, DeFi alone is less than 5% of the entire crypto market cap, but more so the level of talent, the level of innovation, the, the quality of the builders that are joining this space is keeps going up and up and up. And I think that is the primary leading indicator of where we're going. Yeah, and on that, I wanted to, you know, talk to you about, um, this this topic that that we've touched on before where you know you've compared uh, DeFi with a traditional fintech and you know and and how far ahead DeFi comes out when you know using traditional fintech metrics which is pretty surprising um considering what we're talking about right now like how early DeFi is um, but you, you're already seeing things like revenue on, on these protocols, which is something that, you know, many fintechs have, you know, years and years without, <laughs> without it having, and like still being at, like uh, having like unicorn valuation. So, um, yeah, we would love for you to kind of dig into that. Yeah. That's a core premise of what we invest in. I think we pride ourselves when we were to, if we were to send our investment memos to traditional investors, they would understand it. there are tangible metrics by which valuation frameworks that they can understand. Mm. Um, that's sort of a guiding principle of ours, right? Investing in things that have product market fit, that have traction in, in the way of earnings, right? Um, 
but yeah, it's explosive. Like uh, some like synthetics, for instance, mm-hmm. is 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 generating like ten million dollars of of twenty four hour volume, charging thirty basis points. You run rate that on a yearly basis, you're generating call it, you know, fifteen million of run rate fees, and it's trading at like a 30, 40 times forward fee ratio. Not assuming any growth. Mm-hmm. You look at the roadmap, you get conviction, but on a, on a conservative basis, like if you say, okay, it's trading at 30, 40 times forward P ratio, you look at, to your point, traditional fintechs, first of all, many of them don't even have earnings, positive mm-hmm. earnings, but they're public, right? And they trade at um, pretty nosebleed valuations. You've really, it's so interesting. We kind of, you've never really had this like high growth and profitability. And I think it goes back to the initial point, which is these syst- these networks in traditional finance are very hard to bootstrap, very hard to scale. Mm-hmm. But with the way these, the, the, the token design of synthetics allowed it to kind of get to scale in a very capital efficient manner. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at their treasury, they're sitting on $180 million of treasury that they've managed. The network is, call it worth $780 million on a circulating supply, call it a billion on a fully diluted basis. That war chest is controlled by a DAO, and that will incentivize an ecosystem of players like uh, you know, D-Hedge and other participants to build on top of this protocol, mm. which I think is kind of fascinating, where you know, really have this base DeFi layer that provides you know, synthetic, like anyone can create synthetic assets, and then you have on top of it participants and, and use cases that are being built like options and you know, social trading and a number of others. And that just is very interesting from a, like a fat protocol thesis, but applied to DeFi, right? Mm. Uh, where value accrual to the synthetics layer is kind of explosive because you incentivize people to build front end applications on top of your protocol. And those applications building on top of synthetics will end up paying fees to synthetics. So synthetics will also capture part of that value that's being built. Yeah, there's a very clear, that's right. There's a very clear value accrual connection between Mm. anything that's being built on top of synthetics, like uh, D-Hedge, for instance, it creates a social mimetic trading, kind of like eToro or SET protocol, and they're Mm. trading synths. So anytime you trade a synth, there's like a, a a share, a revenue share of the fee between D-Hedge and synthetics base protocol. Mm, okay. Um, so why do you think it's been easier um, for, for DeFi protocols to, to achieve this level of like profitability um, so quickly? Is it, I mean, is the system more efficient? Like are our protocols able to, to get to yeah. this level of volume with fewer people? Like the teams are smaller? Is it like lower cost? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, What's enabling all this? Well, let me put an example, right? Because it's always good to frame it. Like, let's yeah. compare Coinbase and Uniswap. Mm-hmm. So Coinbase uh, trades, I don't know, $24 billion each day. It has a lot of overhead employees, uh, you know, offices, just a lot of overhead to manage these operations. Um, and so, you know, any profit that's generated, any revenue that's generated by Coinbase, you know, gets eaten up by a lot of the, you know, this sort of fat in the middle, which is required to operate this, the power coin base. Mm. You have Uniswap, which is a protocol, it's just code and allows anyone to list your token, trade tokens on a bonding curve. It's a five person team. I think mm. they've now hired Mateo from the blog, which is great. And, but <laughs> you know, it's been, it was a Hayden for a long time and like maybe Dan and a few others. Mm. Uh, but you know, it collapses this sort of, requirement mm. uh and it's 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 sort of it deployed a code and then there's certainly development you know uniswap v1 v2 but it doesn't have the overhead it doesn't have the the drag that coinbase has it also operates cross-border like it's permissionless it's open to mm. anyone and so you know when you really touch untethered pools of liquidity on a global scale it just it's it's explosive right. whereas coinbase is siloed first in the us and the uk and ireland and so it's very fragmented mm-hmm. and it, it's very capital intensive. And so, yeah, I mean, I think like every, think of it this, like the margin on Coinbase might be, I don't know, 40, 60%, maybe 80% if you get the software like margins, the margin on Uniswap, any fee that's generated by the protocol, most of that's going to, well, in this case, there's no token, but in other systems like Aave or Kyber, like most of that fee is actually going to the token holders. So to put it bluntly, you have very capital efficient systems that um, 
you know, are paying effectively, you know, most of the fees to token holders because they don't have any sort of requirements other than like, you know, a team that's sure might have uh, deploying the code and maintaining it and upgrading mm -hmm. the protocol, but it's very, it's, it's order magnitude different. Right? But Uniswap has never been down, operates 365, you know, 24 seven, 365. Coinbase, I think, doesn't can't can't say that. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. It, it goes down when there's like you know market like huge surges and spikes in volume. I mean, to, to be fair, Coinbase still 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 has a lot more trading volume than than Uniswap, right? I mean, so in general, sexes centralized exchanges do for now. For now, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think we're seeing there may be a flipping. Yeah. yeah, I I yeah I believe that. I mean, if it continues to grow at this rate, it's been really exponential so um yeah. but i mean on on the like fees being accrued to these open protocols there's still kind of the risk of there being kind of a risk a race to the bottom right like uh, eventually someone else will come and build a, a cheaper uh, protocol on the side um and then a cheaper one and cheaper one and maybe those margins will will start to compress yeah I, i'd say like I don't know if I fully agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, there is kind of a, a parameter of fees, like, um, you know, synthetics charges 30 basis points, other protocols charge in the similar neighborhood. I think there is a point by which if you charge more than, if you're too rent seeking, you'll lose users. Mm -hmm. But mind you, I think there is a moat, I think in these networks around community, around the mm -hmm. Lindy effect of, of being battle tested um, and, you know, certainly when you introduce a liquidity mining program, it's very reflexive. More liquidity attracts more users, drives more volume, increases, like it's, it's you know, it catalyzes this user acquisition and also liquidity acquisition. Um, um, flywheel effect. Now, not all programs are designed equally, but I think at the end of the day, you have to come at it from a first principle, at least we do, which is, you know, no amount of financial engineering will solve for a bad product. If you have a really good product, if your slippage is tighter than a centralized exchange, if you have more liquidity, people are going to use your protocol and are willing to pay a fee, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, yeah. I think uh, there may be someone who might try to undercut you on the fees, but at the end of the day, it, it becomes harder and harder. I think. Yeah, I think I think you have a great point on on kind of the the network or the community that uh that these protocols have built they're they're not easily replicable replicable um with uh by a competitor that's just offering um a little bit lower fees so also like the the ui like all of that may also kind of uh, play a, a role as well um yeah. so to, to kind of start wrapping up i wanted to uh, talk about kind of the you know, the, the latest hot thing in, in DeFi with liquidity mining, and you, you've touched on it, um, about how incredibly effective these programs have been in driving activity and uh, liquidity to these uh, protocols. Um, but it does seem like all of the, this frenzy um, can't last for, for long. These, you know, huge... Um, triple-digit uh, APYs and all of that, um, and, and also how it's starting to feel like a little bit bubbly uh, in it, from my perspective, you know, like um, these like meme tokens and uh, unaudited protocols and like people seem to just, you know, be here to kind of just take advantage of this, of this trend. Um, so what's your view on, on this mechanism going forward? I mean, will it start to kind of get a, a bad name because of, you know, all, all the people just jumping into like the liquidity mining bandwagon uh, or will, you know, it, it be here kind of uh, for the long term? It's a uh, very, uh, I guess I can take that a million ways, but <clears throat> I think, I think we're seeing the early signs of liquidity mining. I think synthetic started a year, year and a half ago, compound balancer, <clears throat> UMA, certain protocols are starting to wake up to this notion that you kind of need it from a user acquisition perspective. And um, I think it becomes a very powerful mechanism. Not all systems are designed the same. Um, 
I do agree with you to a certain extent. Some programs are unsustainable. Um, others are <clears throat> have a more clear, sustainable approach to creating value. So like compounds issued over four years, um, but it has some flaws, right? I mean, it, it, anyone can farm and dump, which mm-hmm. is I think what you're getting at, right? Mm-hmm. There are other systems where you can, you're incentivized to not do that. Uh, and and get rewarded for you know being a long term user of the protocol. It's almost no. I mean, we saw this in startup land, right? I mean, you had mm-hmm. direct to consumer companies like Blue Apron and Uber, and a lot of these companies just threw money at consumers to acquire users at all costs. Mm-hmm. That never ends well, mm-hmm. you know. And in similar manner, you know, anytime you give people the opportunity to earn what seems to be free money, there's risks attached to it. Um, then they're going to take it, right? And they they may do farm and dump, right? <clears throat> But I think the really clever, the really teams that really get it are the ones that design a program that is sustainable, that is keeps in mind acquiring the right type of user. Mm. I mean, the question is, would you rather have like a million users that might stick around for two days uh, and then go to the next thing? Or would you rather have a thousand core users that are going to be so engaged, so involved in the community to drive this protocol forward? I think in many ways, synthetics got this right from the beginning. I mean, you mm. had to lock your synthetics rewards for a year. Mm. There is a capital cost. Asso- there is an opportunity cost associated with that. But meanwhile, synthetics has p- created, I mean, look, look at where it is now. Mm. I mean, it, it has perhaps one of the most strongest communities that I can think of. Um, the community is very active in governance. The, the, syst- the, the It progressively decentralized until recently where it created three different DAOs. And the community is very involved. Mm. Um, and so it might not have the most total value locked vanity metric, but it might not have the highest volume. But it is, if you take the long view, I would argue, I place my bet, you know, on that type of program working um, mm. that is incentivizing the right user. Uh, yeah, it's it, buyer beware, right? Any Anytime it feels too good to be true, there's either a lot of risks associated with it. Um, you're right. There are some pro- protocols that are launching these <clears throat> programs that are not audited, and it's important to, you know, it's important to factor that and take that into account. Right. Um, because I mean, w- with these kind of like programs that feel a little bit more sh- like short-sighted or not short-sighted, but not not thought out to to be like for long-term holders like like synthetics or or compound what's kind of the um, the risk there because it feels like okay so you're you're a trader you're putting in tokens to get uh these new like farmed token at like whatever 100 percent apy um and and then but it's but like somebody needs has to be on the other side um like I, i'm just trying to understand like in in in, in these um in these projects, like who are the winners and losers? Is, is the loser like the the guy who ends up uh, buying the token at, at the top, who's like taking the risk, or? Yeah, no, certainly. Um, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I think you know th- there is always a dynamic where, you know, there, look, there's market and sellers in any market, right? Um, uh, for something like farming, you have effectively no cost of cap. Like you're you're earning these tokens. Um, think of Wi-Fi fascinating experiment, YAM, you know, you're depositing idle assets and energizing them and earning this token in a protocol that is allowing you to, you know, a lot of these are like, let's just throw it in the wall, see what sticks, create a community around it. I will say though, to be fair, YAM went from zero to 600 in total value locked in in out, in 24 hours. Yeah, 600 million. <laughs> 600 million, it took yeah, Aave, yeah. It, it, you saw it took Maker it's two years, it took like two years. One day. Now you could argue, well, m- you know, there's still 300 million there in earning yams. Mm-hmm. I look at that and that's a very interesting experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, look, I mean, drama aside, you know, audits, whatever, no comment on that. I mean, I think there ought to be like more formal review and, and create a get going program to audit these things and make sure they're battle tested before they go live. Fair point. But I will say it's kind of a very interesting experiment where, you know, it felt like a video game. It felt it was addicting. It created a community. Everyone mm. coalesced. It sucked the energy out of the room in a way that 
it's hard to ignore. I mean, yeah. any company might like, it, and now what do you do with that? Right. You have mm -hmm. all this energy harnessed then what do you do with that? And I think the value prop of that is, well, let's create a nice community and what other things can we build on top of that? And I think mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit of, Hey, let's, let's come together. And I think let's create like Wi-Fi, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. has been a fascinating experiment. That yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so, you know, not every program is the same, but I think, it's really interesting to see this community driven approach and how quickly these networks can, can scale. Uh, and there'll be a lot of experimentation. So, you know, I think it's, maybe we'll revisit this in six months and say, yeah, that was like, you know, criticize it or what have you, or maybe it's, this is a new paradigm to yeah. create communities and communities build a lot of value. Right. Mm. It's interesting because it, you're right that it does shift kind of the, the traditional roadmap on its head. It's like, let's, create community first and like drive uh, liquidity and volume as quickly as possible. And then we'll figure out, figure out a way to make it kind of useful and safe yeah. <laughs> instead of like, don't, don't forget yeah. this. Um, it's not creating a community of enthusiasts is extremely powerful. Look at video games. I mean, it, it, it sounds trivial, but this is what we think about value, right? Mm. It's not just about monetary incentives. It's about being part of something that you feel attached to, mm. that you have a, 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 an affiliation towards. And at the end of the day, it's touching a very primitive desire to, to connect with people, to connect mm. with others. I mean, look, it's going to sound like a stretch, but I do believe that really transformational technology touches a primitive human need, desire, emotion. And as humans we have a desire to connect with others. And mm. if, if people don't see the out, maybe it's a stretch, but owning YAM or owning Wi-Fi and being part of governance and anyone from their dorm room, you don't care about their age, their race, where they are, what credentials they have. It's who has the best ideas to create a system. Mm. And honestly, I mean, I think out of the sovereign individual had this right, which is power is shifting from experts to broadly anyone in an ecosystem and it's mm -hmm. about what value do you bring and i'll say this you asked me the question as vcs as investors as i mean everyone it's it's a competitive game. it's like you need to it's like what have you done lately how mm -hmm. relevant are you in this space and i think it's a constant game it's competitive and it's open source and it's and you know what that i think introduces a level of healthy competition to create systems that you know, the intellectual firepower in a discussion around Wi-Fi or YAM and different designs is, yeah, I mean, skip school and just go directly to the community governance and like, interact <laughs> with people. Yeah. No, I mean, seriously. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, I think we're all in this space because we've learned so much. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the smartest people that I've met are in crypto. And that mm -hmm. to me is the most rewarding thing. And I think we're, it, it will only continue to attract. We need better talent. We need better builders. I think we're seeing that, and that is the the primary proxy of how much potential this space has. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so maybe a kind of smart competitive community is the killer use case of blockchain, <laughs> and YAM is a peek into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great way to to end the conversation. This has been incredibly interesting, Santiago. Thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> Thank you, Camila. Thanks so much. Yay. Take care.